everyone and welcome to the first episode of the Big Dress Energy podcast. This podcast ultimately is going to explore everything to do with fashion psychology, how you can harness psychological scientific tips to just get the most out of your wardrobe, understanding why we need to get a better relationship with our clothes, how it's the missing puzzle piece in all of these topics about sustainability and consumerism and really just understand how you can use your wardrobe and your appearance to transform yourself. This podcast is modeled off of my debut book of the same name, Big Just Energy, which is out on September the 15th at all good bookstores. I've always wanted to say that. Um, and I'm really excited today because joining me are two fantastic women who I've been you know, in contact, I think for a long time and who've inspired me along my journey as well. Um, so firstly, we have Joanne Entwistle. Joanne is a scholar in culture, media and creative studies at King's College London. And she's also the author of The Fashioned Body, which is the holy grail of all things, you know, to do with fashion and identity. So thank you so much, Joanne, for coming on board today. And we also have Dr. Dion Terenlong. She is a practitioner psychologist and she's all in, interested in the link between personal style and self-expression and well-being. So Hi. thank you both so much for joining me today. It's so great thank to you. have you both on board. Um, so to just kick things off, I have a question for both of you. So in your own words, what does having big just energy mean to you? And Joe, I think we'll start with you first. Um, well, um, I would say that what we want when we go out when we get dressed is to project something of ourselves um and we might be doing that consciously or we might be doing that quite unconsciously mm -hmm. you know, but um but people i mean big dress energy is i think when you're trying to make a statement with what you're what you're, what you're wearing which isn't really everybody because i know my husband doesn't do that he doesn't have big dress energy most days <laughs> um, there are days when, yeah, I think a lot of women want to harness that. They want to actually make some kind of statement and they know their clothes are yeah. visible. It's a, a very kind of prominent part of their identity when they step out. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And Dion, what about you? What does big dress energy mean to you? Surprise question, Shakela. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was thinking, um, when you say big dress energy to me, it makes me think about kind of good dress energy. And just think about those days when you put on something and you just feel like feeling yourself in the outfit and you just feel very positive, very comfortable, very at ease. And you kind of walk down the street with your head held a little bit higher and you're able to more confidently and competently face the dread day. That's what comes to mind for me when I think of kind of big dress energy is that feeling inside. Yeah. I think that's perfect. That's exactly what I was going for with the title as well. I think a lot of the times when people think they just energy or fashion in general, they think, you know, maybe something luxury or someone that is heavy into aesthetics and following the latest trends and spending so much money on their clothes. When really it's about how you feel in your clothes, how you use them as a tool to go throughout the day, being very intentional with what you're wearing. Um, and just making sure that your emotions are taking precedent and not just the aesthetics of what you're wearing. So spot on both of you. Um, that's fantastic. And let's dive on in. Let's see on I'll talk to you first. So what drew you to a career in fashion psychology? Like I always said, it's not something that you wake up in the morning and think, mm, okay, this is a this is an easy career path. It's not something, you know, you tell little kids at school, you're not going to find a, a job post on LinkedIn to do with fashion psychology. So what yeah. drew you on this weird and wonderful career path? It's true. And I always feel so guilty when I get messages on LinkedIn or anywhere saying, how do I become a fashion psychologist? It's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what drew me to the field, I think, I kind of naturally fell into it and I fell into it before there was a name for it and before I had a sense of what it was. All I knew was, well, I'm, I'm a nosy person and I like to know what's going on, hence why I became a psychologist. But then when I was working and studying psychology, I just felt like something was missing a little bit, that we very much attend to um, the internal world of individuals and within groups, but we don't really think about their external worlds with as much detail in particular, think about what we wear and we get dressed every single day. So it felt like something that was so inextricably linked to our day-to-day -day well-being, our, our beings, our our confidence, our self-esteem, but I wondered why we were neglecting this area. And also I do love 
fashion like for other people like watching what other people are wearing again that's where the nosiness comes in um <laughs> and just like i get pleasure from looking at beautiful clothes as well and so if i you know my thoughts were can i bring these two together can i bring my love of fashion my love of um psychology and i want to increase the confidence and the self-esteem and the autonomy of individuals together so that's when i kind of tried to create a consultancy which I kind of saw as more style psychology. Um, and then obviously the field of fashion psychology started to grow. So it kind of just aligned itself with that. And it was kind of like, okay, what I'm doing kind of fit, fits under the umbrella of fashion psychology. So let's mosey on yeah. in there. Yeah, I think our motivations are very aligned as well. Like I mm. was always interested in fashion, but people as well. I love people watching and mm. I love what everyone's wearing. And it really annoys me when people say oh, they don't they don't care about clothes, but uh, we're not, you know, belonging to a nudist society. <laughs> like we all have to wear clothes and that's a decision that we make every day, choosing to wear this rather than that. And, you know, those decisions say something about people, which of course is psychology in a nutshell, really. Um, and then Joe, same to you, what like what led you down this particular career? Um, I mean, I think probably very similar um, inspiration, really. I think I was really curious about how people got dressed in the morning. And I'd done a degree in sociology. And so the questions were really, this is such a big part of the social world, right? This, yeah. um, having to get dressed, we don't live in the nudist colony. Very few of us do. Uh, we do have to prepare our body and we, we have implicit knowledge as to what we need to do to make our bodies appropriate when we need to leave the house. So I was really mm -hmm. curious about that. And when I was thinking about doing a PhD many, many years ago now, mm -hmm. it was like, what literature, who has written about this? It's such an evident part of the social world. Everybody gets dressed. So where's the sociology? Where's the writing about what is framing those dress choices? What is what is what are the motivations? What are the structures? What are the kind of relations of power um, that promote us or you know prompt us to dress in certain ways? And there was no literature. So I sort of cobbled together my own kind of way of studying this through um, how do we look at structures? What are the forces that impinge upon our dress choice? What yeah. kind of uh, ways do we think about our dress and our bodies? Um, and then what kind of agency do we bring to that? We know that there are structures. We know that we have to address appropriately for certain situations, mm -hmm. but we have choices within that. Um, and every yeah. day we have to go wardrobe, we have to make certain choices. How do we do mm -hmm. that? How do we feel about our choices? How is it that we present our bodies? Because it's we are our bodies. Um, they, are, they are our vehicle in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's very important what we do with them, right? And even mm -hmm. if people claim to not care, they still have to do it in some way. So I just was curious. And, yeah. and I feel like the both of you really also, I love to get dressed. I really enjoy clothes. Mm -hmm. um, so it just felt like a natural um, aspect of the social world for me to study, really. Yeah. And I Maybe don't know. If, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Dion. I was just thinking of what Joe said about people not caring. And I was just going to say that even not caring is an emotion or a feeling yeah. related to clothing. So it's, it's still relevant. I still want to know why you, why you don't care and what that means. Yeah. And, what is it about fashion that you feel you want to distance yourself from that yeah. is invoking you? What is that? Yeah, yeah, and why? Yeah, I think that's such that's such an important point as well. And I don't know if you both experienced this, but me especially when I just did my master's degree in fashion psychology, um, it, my picture went viral. And as much as I got a lot of good, you know, positive feedback, I got a lot of this degree is nonsense like what are you going to do with that like what is the point um from a few people as well in the psychology community you know i always feel like clinical psychology is on like it's at the top of the pyramid and anything else even sociology everything else is like very, social psychology is very much at the bottom did you guys like experience the same thing and how did you kind of overcome that Dion, do you want to take that because you're probably experienced similar <laughs> um, I I'm don't quite have the same, but I would say because obviously I, my background is a, in a more traditional field of psychology as well. Mm -hmm. So along with a clinical psychologist, so I'm a child and educational psychologist. So we train the same place and um, or sometimes. And I did get a little bit of from my colleagues, my peers, when I was mm -hmm. talking about clothing or I was going to those little talks, they were just confused. Yeah. And they're kind of like, well, what are you doing? Like, what, what? They, they kind of didn't see the importance in it. They didn't see that it was worth my time, that it was worth my consideration. You got a lot of kind of 
flippant comments, throwaway comments. I still get them every now and again. I get, I go in the office and I get, well, tell me what's on trend. What should I be wearing? And I'm like, mm. I don't know. Wear whatever you want. Wear whatever yeah, you want that's not it. Yeah, it's the same when you're like saying, I'm studying psychology. Someone's very young. It's, oh, read my mind. Um, yes. No, that's <laughs> not what psychology is. And it's the same yeah. with Russian psychology. I'm not going to tell yeah. you that what it means when you wear something like this it's more in depth it's about yeah your motivations and how people respond to you as well and your cultural background like how you're feeling in the moment all of those things that impact the way you dress and mm -hmm. yeah it's frustrating because there's so much that goes into it and to have like your peers as well not acknowledge that because mm -hmm. you know they come from this they should understand that's what mm -hmm. incorporates psychology yeah. So it's changing a little bit. So I, I think maybe the more I do it, the more my peers see it. And like, you know, having some things published in the BPS, which is obviously the magazine that the psychologists read, then they kind of start to understand. And I think with the accreditation of the course at LCF, that helps a little bit as well. But obviously that's still quite new. Yeah. Um, and we haven't really seen any kind of specific like academic scholars per se mm -hmm. come out. And unfortunately this is not how it necessarily should be I feel like psychologists and psychology field is quite an old field and we are very rooted in structure this is how things are and you know this is um this field of psychology that field of psychology and if it's not listed on the bps it's just it's not a thing um and yeah we kind of uh, prioritize certain areas over others and i think fashion is continuously, even though it's not all about fashion, this is about people's relationships with clothing, people's mm -hmm. relationships with consumerism, yeah. um, that it is denigrated and looked down upon. Mm -hmm. So it's seen as frivolous, and that's what I would always use, but that is how it's seen as fluffy and frivolous, and mm -hmm. psychology is a science, a social science, therefore it has, it's all about rigour, and all about serious scholarly study, which is of, in some psychologist books, should not include anything to do with fashion or clothing. Mm -hmm. Jo, what about you? What's your experience been? Exactly the same. When I started doing um, work in sociology, there was no sociology of dress. It was a little bit of anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, but dress was something that other people did, and it was something it was part of kind of more primitive cultures, that have a kind of older version of anthropology. And mm -hmm. sociology just didn't look at that. It looked at serious stuff, you know, like, like, like you're saying in terms of it's an old discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was full of quite old men when I was kind of going around conferences back mm -hmm. in the early days as a PhD student. I mean, it was just filled with quite old men in corduroy and mm -hmm. they just really weren't interested. So I was quite unusual um, mm -hmm. because it was just a bit frivolous and a bit fluffy and a bit lightweight. Um, yeah. Why am I doing this? Um, mm -hmm. Now that has also changed. I think it's changed a lot in recent years. And I think these days it wouldn't you would go to a conference and you wouldn't necessarily be the only person doing something on dress. I also made a point very early on of saying, I'm going to publish a paper in the Journal of British Sociology. Yes. And I did, I can't remember what date it was, but it was very important that I had at least one paper in the kind of um, yeah. British Sociological Association's journal that gave it some accreditation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, and I've been in other kind of mainstream, kind of highly cred um, credible um, sociology journals since. So I don't just publish in fashion theory or fashion journals. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that also gives you that little bit of status and it elevates the, the yeah. effect so that you, you know, you are kind of part of your professional body, you know, you're mm -hmm. seen, peer reviewed. So that's part of the academic kind of um, power play, I guess. Um, yeah I don't know I felt the same like until I got published I just felt like oh I'm not a real psychologist it's kind of weird that because of course you do want the field to have some sort of credibility and that's where the publishing kind of comes from but it took me a long time to get my paper published I got rejected from a lot of journals because they just didn't think it was important my paper was looking at um, race in terms of the fashion industry and advertising and how that impacts consumer behaviors and um, if I told you guys the comments I got from some of these reviewers just saying like, this is nonsense, like what's the point, this is not science, like it, it can really be quite disheartening. And it's a shame because you also have to think about the people who are gatekeeping, um, you know, these journals and who's stopping us from getting in. And I've had a few conversations with a few people talking about, you know, maybe it's chance, it's an opportunity for people like us to create our own, like start thinking about our own, our own accreditations, our own journals and things like that. So, because, you know, there's a lot of research in this area, but it's just not the people that are behind the, you know, decision making. They're not 
giving it the same kind of weight. And that kind of leads me on to Joe talking about your book, The Fashioned Body. That was such a huge inspiration for me. I finally felt that there was some sort of text that had the research in it, the depth to it, that was talking about this aspect of sociology, you know, psychology and dress. Um, tell me more about what was your like goals for it and you know, how was the process of writing it? I mean, I, as I said before, when I started thinking about a PhD, I knew I wanted to look at dress bodies um, and I wanted to find a methodology for um, studying the dress body. And there wasn't really very much literature there. So I was very much um, trying to pull together a methodology. How can we study dress bodies in a sociological way and see the dress body as a really critical part of the social world? Every situation you go to, you're going to see dress bodies. How can mm -hmm. we think um, about that? So I had a brilliant supervisor at Goldsmiths, Helen Thomas, and she was a dance specialist, actually. So she was very much interested in the body mm -hmm. in the social world. And yeah. she just got me reading really serious philosophical stuff, um, Michel Foucault um, and some uh, Merleau-Ponty stuff around phenomenology. How do we feel embodied? How, what does it feel like to have a body uh, mm -hmm. and to move the space with a body? And I was just kind of pulling together a lot of different theoretical resources with sociology to think about the dress body. And I wanted a case study. I wanted to demonstrate that you can do a study, uh, a very proper sociological study of the body and I needed a case study. So I chose women in the professional world of work. I chose career women because mm -hmm. there seemed to be a very explicit um, situation for which people would have to get dressed. And I would have, um, I'd be able to talk to people about dress in a way that is probably more conscious. I gathered or thought that probably career women will be thinking really seriously about their bodies in public space. And there was a whole discourse around power dressing at the time that would emerge in the 70s. Mm -hmm. and the had famously been power dressed and there were dress manuals and there was cosmopolitan magazine and you know kind of articles about how women can present their body uh, minimize the potential sexuality of their body uh, mm -hmm. to manage the kind of male gaze to manage their bodies in space uh, at work so i just kind of used that as a case study and to, to kind of demonstrate really look how important dress is okay? look yeah. at the structuring constraints on dress bodies look at what the things women have to do to their body, the way they have to think about their body, the choices they have to make. Um, so I did qualitative research, I looked at texts, and I also spoke to career women about how they get dressed for work. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and that was the PhD, and then it became the fashion body. I took extracts of that, and then the methodology, and then developed that when I when I was writing fashion body. Um, yeah. The kind of textbook, you know, here we go, look at this, how important is dress to the social world? Yeah. I think, yeah, I just love the parts as well where you talk about, yeah, the role of fashion in modern culture, but more specifically when you talk about the role of fashion in forming someone's social identity and you talk about gender and how it plays a role in someone's lives. Like, can you tell us a bit more about that? Like the role of clothing in like the role of like everyday people and how it helps them to get through one stage of their lives to the next? Well, I mean, when women, I mean, a lot of the women I was interviewing were a bit older than me, but they'd all kind of, try to make you know climb the kind of career ladder and they mm. had all at various times been prompted to think about how they dress or had become very aware of of the way their body might be perceived in uh in space and how they might um might negatively be seen and how mm. they would have to manage their breasts you know if they would have to so they wear a jacket like i'm wearing today mm -hmm. um, so this kind of power suit became a way of handling the kind of the, the way their body might be read or seen obviously the jacket was based upon the male suit anyway that historically had been um the uniform that men have worn to work mm -hmm. so yeah it was just like how do these individual women navigate the various aspects of the workplace the people they encounter in the workplace um, and what kind of choices do they make and what, what resources do they draw upon? So dress manuals, women's magazines were places where women would seek help for thinking about um, yeah, what to wear for work, really. How do they get around these issues about their body, how their body might be seen as sexy in some way and how that mm -hmm. sexiness might undermine their seriousness, really. Yeah. Kind of, you know, manage that because mm -hmm. to be seen as sexy... I mean, the whole thing about um, power dressing was that you had to distinguish yourself from the secretary. The secretaries that were seen as sexy. Um, that there was a historic association from the 50s of kind of cardigans and typewriters and 
you know, the kind of um, stereotype of the se secretary and career women did not want to be in the room being asked to make the tea or to take the minutes in the meeting. They had to mm -hmm. indicate with their dress, here, I'm, I am a professional woman, I'm, I'm the chair of this meeting, I'm not here, I'm not the tea lady. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of, kind of um, issues of distinction that women had to draw through their dress to kind of mark their body out as professional, uh, as, the, as a career woman, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Dion, I know you mentioned before that you used to work as um, like personal shopping. Is that correct? Yeah. So yes, I know. Yeah. What? So what were the challenges as well that you found that some of your clients faced, and like how did you help them overcome it? Mm, well, when I was uh, so I was still studying while I was work. Actually, no, I was while I was studying and after I was working as a stylist part time. And when I was just working as a pure stylist for another company, so I was just doing only styling. So you've only got a finite amount of time. If they booked you for an hour shopping, hour and a half, you've only got that time or two hours. And there are a range of issues. Some people, they just wanted to change their look and mm -hmm. they weren't sure where to start. So they wanted to seek kind of professional advice to help explore new styles and kind of like take risks and things. But what stuck out for me and what led me to creating the consultancy and to kind of getting more into fashion psychology was the negative self-talk that people engaged in. Yeah. It really, really landed with me and it was quite hard to take and it was very hard to yeah. not probe or ask more questions or try to offer support. But I wasn't there in a role as a psychologist. I was there in a role as a stylist. And if their time is ticking, I need to make sure they come away with a certain amount of outfits in that time. And you've got around the whole of, whole of Westfields or Oxford Street and you don't have time for a psychological consultation in there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I think I've used an example before, but it's one that sticks with me the most. And it was a woman who wanted some new outfits and in particular something to wear to her birthday. Yeah. And she said to me that she's not anything that shows her arms because she doesn't want her family to comment on her fat arms. Mm. And I just thought that just hit me. I thought there's so much that needs unpicking there. Yeah. Why am I gonna go off to House of Fraser and start buying your stuff now? Like we need to sit down, we need to stop for a moment. Mm. We need to explore your self-perceptions we need to explore this negative self-talk we yeah. need to explore your ideal self we need to explore where these notions have come from what's going on with this dynamic between you and your family while you believe mm -hmm. going to your own birthday they're going to comment on your arms i was just like yeah. the last thing you need right now is a new blouse like yeah. that is not the buy um but that kind of thing often happened with people commenting you know or even when they would wear you find them an outfit and they were so surprised that sometimes people would cry or become very emotional because they were surprised they could look nice as they would say. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why would you not? Like, it's not about looking fashionable or on trend or looking hot for anyone in particular. Yes. It's just more about, do you feel happy and comfortable in what you're wearing? Yes. And just showing them and giving them that support and that holding, holding their hand and guiding them to try out the things they wouldn't necessarily be confident enough to try or to go into the shops that wouldn't be normally confident enough to walk into by you showing them and going, okay, let's try this and try this on with you. Yeah. People, I think they really appreciated that guiding hand. And then suddenly it would make all the world a difference to them. And almost it was like you were watching them see themselves in a different light. Mm -hmm. And it made me sad. And I thought, why does it, why is it taken a new outfit to do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. And I think, you know, body image has been such a popular topic for so many years. And I yeah. do think that clothing is missing from the conversation of body image. It's something I talked about in my book as well, how, you know, clothes can impact either positively or negatively how you feel about your body. And this is something, Joe, you talked about in the fashion body as well. You talked about, um, you know, people's relationships with their body. It has, it's very dynamic depending on their outfits as well. And oftentimes when people wear an outfit and it doesn't look good, they'll blame themselves as well. Can you speak more to like that joke about people's yeah. image and their and their clothes. I mean, I mean, one of the ways in which you, I've written about it, and I think other scholars have, have done since, is the idea of comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are two senses of comfort. So there is the physical comfort, like do the clothes fit? Do you feel good in them? That big dress energy feeling, or that feeling yeah. that somehow all the elements came together well today, and you feel like you're wearing the right outfit for the occasion. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of physical comfort of clothing, and then there's the comfort of being appropriately dressed, 
to have the right outfit for that occasion and to you know we've all had that experience of wearing the wrong outfit um mm -hmm. either because it's too tight or it doesn't fit or you get a stain on it or because you arrive and it's a formal dress event and you're too casual or it's a very casual event and you've turned up too formal and you're not comfortable because you don't fit the situation mm -hmm. um, and i think that's a big part of what we aim to that sweet spot when we get dressed is to just feel yeah this looks good I feel right for the occasion and then you can actually forget about your dress when everything comes together and those two ideas of comfort come together mm -hmm. you can then just get on and be confident in a meeting speak you're not fiddling with something because it doesn't fit right mm -hmm. or you're not feeling oh my goodness i'm not really uh dressed appropriately for this situation but yeah. you can forget about it when when it all comes together those two ideas of comfort bodily comfort and sort of social comfort if you like mm -hmm. yeah. and Beyond like comfort and like power dressing and the role that, you know, clothes play in helping us navigate, navigate different situations. I think a big topic that's come up a lot recently as well is gender and clothing. And I think as well, Joe, that's something you've explored a lot. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the role, like from a sociological, sociological perspective, how does our gender identity inform our style and vice versa? I mean, gender is one of the key markers that our clothes articulate. So they're like one of the big things that we take to see. We can read off people quite quickly. That we can usually we do gender people, we do gender bodies. It is changing with the kind of debate about trans, and I think there is a fuzziness now around gender that perhaps there wasn't a while ago. Um, go back twenty years, and I think we, we didn't really see that debate about trans. But generally, we kind of do assume. You know, we wear clothes that we know gender our body that we want to feel comfortable with that gender identity that we present and then others read us as yeah. male or female or if we're choosing to kind of be in a space that's not binary male or female we would want our dress to, to maybe have that to be ambiguous mm -hmm. as a gender yeah. it's a very big part of what when we're getting dressed i think our gender identity is our sense of ourself it's part of that sense of comfort and um, you know we want to feel comfortable in that gender that we are presenting or projecting. We want others to read us appropriately. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, a lot of people are starting to realise that you know as much as we think of certain clothes as like you know, even colours like oh if you wear pink it's for girls and blue it's for boys like that is not something that has any root in anything other than culture. No, I mean that's historically it's... variable. I mean yeah. all the many of our markers of gender um if you go back further in time they would have been they could have been in reverse but pink was seen as a more definite color um mm -hmm. pre second world war first world war um or between the wars really it starts to change but pink was based on red so it was seen to be a more powerful confident color and mm -hmm. blue was soft and and our lady in the kind of catholic church and um, the virgin mary is always in blue so blue yeah. was for a girl and pink was for a boy so we these markers have changed um mm -hmm. Uh, there, there's nothing kind of um, yeah, there's nothing kind of significant about them. They they kind of vary across time and across place as well. Skirts, of course, are the biggest marker of gender, yeah. and um, we know there's lots and lots of cultures where skirts are worn by men. Various forms of caftans and skirted outfits are worn by men um, and women alike. There isn't any distinction in that respect. Whereas in the West and in Europe, the skirt became a marker of femininity. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I, I guess, Dion, as well, what do you think about the way people are now using clothing as a way to step out of different identities that may be ones that, they, that were placed on them from birth? Mm. I feel like people are showing the signs of a lot more autonomy with using clothing. So mm -hmm. they're making clothing work for them rather than um, allowing themselves to be put in certain boxes based on clothing. And thinking about the 90s and actually even still now, the way that shops will kind of like split up their clothing by floor, like men's wear second floor, women's wear first floor. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing the way younger people now, will, I, even I actually, I'm not a young person, but I will shop in any department and mm -hmm. I'll kind of I'll be looking for a t-shirt and they'll say to me, well, women's wear is over here, madam. I'm like, please don't call me madam. And also <laughs> I have just I have a t-shirt and I think as long as yeah. it's got armholes, it will work for me. Yeah. So I think there definitely has been a shift and it's been fantastic. And I've, you know, um, spoken with some kind of tr um, charities that work with people who are trans and non-binary um, and also work with like close friends or clients who are seeking to uh, kind of work to make their 
gender expression align with their gender identity and just thinking mm. how to do that because like you said you spend so long maybe being dressed by your parents or yeah. as a child or your teens dressing in order to fit in with your peers and mm. at that time people are kind of jostling trying to find their place in society their place in their peer groups so you are really working very hard probably from around the age of 11 just to fit in there's a real push for sameness at that time. And it's not until you get a bit older that you feel like you've got the confidence and the more concrete sense of self to step away from the pack. Yeah. So that's when people start to really make use of clothing to say, okay, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And also they understand now, I think that you don't have to be stuck in one style and that your style and as well as your gender expression can mm -hmm. change day to day. You know, some people one day you want to present as very femme, other days when I present as quite mask. Even I do that myself. I'll wear something very feminine, very froofy. But then another day I will just wear almost like like my dad's old heavy blazer with like big trousers, feeling very mask. And I love that. I love that dress freedom that we now have. Yes. And that people now understand that it's not only men can wear this, only women can wear this. That very dichotomous, very limited thinking is mm -hmm. beginning to shake and break down. I'm really excited to see where it goes in terms of the fashion industry in particular. Yeah, same. I have always like had an issue with the idea of having a signature style. I feel like that was something that was so popular back in the day, like putting yourself in these boxes, depending yeah. on what you're wearing. And all of your outfits had to follow like this specific style and aesthetic. And it's mm. just so it's so limiting and it mm. doesn't help us to reflect all of the different aspects of our identity. And like you said, Dion, like our identity is fluid. It changes mm. Constantly, not just like as we grow older, but day to day. So I think clothes are a really underutilized tool to help us express that. And even like the men's t-shirts, so I find they're always better than the women's ones. They have like better prints. They just look cooler. They're always better quality. They've always got yes. more cotton. I'm like, what's? <laughs> yes, the women's are always thin and horrible. And oh gosh. But anyway, moving on. I think we've talked about a lot of big topics, and one of the biggest ones is sustainability. And Dion, I know that's something we've spoken a lot about. If you follow Dion on Instagram, every other post is something about sustainability. And I just think it's fantastic. And, you know, from a psychological perspective, what do you think is needed for brands and consumers to really tackle sustainability head on? Because I often think that not many people think about the psychological aspect of it. It's very much like you're killing the planet and just chastising people for doing it, but not getting into the nitty gritty of why we got here. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the psychological underpinning behind, you know, this issue? I would say if I start with brands first, I think that the way mm -hmm. we think about um, sustainability and responsibility will vary. We're thinking about individual consumers or we'll thinking about the brand. And I yeah. think if we're thinking about brands, it's not a psychological thing, but the what I think will make the biggest difference is if we kind of follow France's lead. And then if we bring in the kind of extended responsibility for brands, whereby they have to factor into their costs and are held accountable, not only at the point of production and sale, but also at the point of disposal, that they should factor in what happens to their garment after its life cycle. How do they try to increase longevity and keep it in circulation as long as possible, that they are actually actively, legally held responsible for that garment and the potential damage it could do if they're designing these kind of particularly these throwaway garments that, you know, are made poorly, are sold cheaply, last only a few months, and then where do they go? And then people want to hold their hands up, particularly brands say, well, it's not our responsibility anymore. But it is because you created it and you put it out there. So I think this kind of notion of the extended responsibility for brands, I think, is a really important thing that if it can get pushed through in terms of legislation, will make the world of difference. Um, but then if we're thinking about psychological constructs and what might be going on psychologically, I think there's an element of kind of bystander behavior that is happening in regards to consumers and with big brands and people kind of stepping back and saying, well, you know, we're not the only ones doing it. Everyone else is doing it too, or we're doing it, but we're not as bad as them over there. It's this mm. kind of displaced responsibility. Um, yes. and nobody wanting to step up you know we see smaller brands stepping up and they're able to be a bit more accountable to show empathy for their workers and to focus on working ethically and not just focus on the bottom line of you know how can we make sure we get the most amount of profit here but also to really consider the impact 
that their production, their clothing is having on individual lives and people's well-being, on the environment, on people's pockets even. You know, we are going into an economic crisis. Mm. Um, so I think there's that, that psychologically what people tend to do is we look around at our peers and we look left and right and we say, what are they doing over there? What are they doing over there? And as long as other big brands are also sitting on their hands, they're going to look at their competitors and say, well, they haven't moved yet or they've not done anything yet and they'll do nothing. Yeah. And this, that's what happens. Like that's the classic theory of bystander behavior is whereby if something happens in the street and there's a big crowd, nobody will do anything until they see somebody else do it. Yeah, it's that kind of social proof. I think, yeah, we even saw, I think today, um, one of the big, one of the fast fashion brands, I think it's um, PLT, pretty little thing. They're now introducing that um, rewear, you know, give us back your old clothes and you can rewear. Oh, so yeah, and I do think it's, it's from the fact that there's a lot of social pressure now, you know, yeah. being socially conscious and sustainable is, is, yeah. in, is in fashion, which is good. Um, but Joe, I wanted to talk more about from the consumer side. So we did talk, briefly about you know the role of clothing in impacting our identity and making us feel good and helping us navigate different environments different situations helping women navigate workspace like all of these different things but at the same time you know the world simply has too many clothes really when you think about it we we have this issue of overconsumption. a lot of people who sometimes might take real value in their clothes and how it shapes their identity their wardrobes are still overflowing so where do you think the line is and how do you think people can kind of navigate their desire to be sustainable, but also their desire to use their clothes as such an important tool for their well-being? I mean, it's, it's a big question. Um, and I think there are multiple responses. Um, I think there is a growing awareness probably across all age groups now that we need to take care and think about our consumption. Um, I think it'd be hard if you have to be living in a cave to not know that we've got a climate crisis and emergency and we need to adjust what we how we consume um i think young people i mean i've got two teenage girls and i think young people are very aware i mean i know my girls are actually very frightened about climate change and i think there is definitely a move amongst younger the younger generation to think about where they get their clothes from um so I think there is a kind of growing movement, but it's very, very slow, I think. Um, and possibly also, um, you know, as Dion's been saying, I mean, the whole kind of move, even with brands, it's moving too slow, really, for the actual impending disaster that we have. Um, but I mean, there, but, but, but it is growing. I mean, I'm, you know, when I wrote the book, I've done three editions of my book now. And in the first edition, no mention of climate change. The second edition, a little mention of it in 2015. So the book came out in 2000 no mention um that's a long time ago and we weren't really talking about these things in relation no, to 2015 i included it so there is a mention and there's a you know a section in in the introduction but i didn't make a big edit on the second edition i've just done the third edition and it's got a big place now because it's simply impossible to do anything to write about or think about fashion or even to be a consumer without and, and knowing something or addressing this worry that we have about the environment and about overconsumption. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's happening and it, I've seen it happen in the time that I've been a, a fashion scholar and as a consumer, yeah. but it is slow and it's it, it needs to speed up, you know, and, I, and mm. I think there are alternatives now. I think probably that's the one big thing that we've seen. We've got fashion rental companies. Um, I think even in the last three or four years, I've got PhD students studying this. And in the last three mm. years, there's been an explosion of rental companies. Whether they address the issue of sustainability, I, I don't know, the jury's out. But just mm. the fact that there are more and more players coming into the market and more and more brands. I was in, actually in Henny's, I was down on Otter Street and my girls had to get a, a few bits for their for their school wardrobe and university. And you know we have the returns policy. So that's a kind of very major fast fashion. Yeah. And that's, you know, you do the return, you get five, five pound back if you take some clothes in. So there's a little bit of thinking there, even at the kind of um, top end of the fast fashion model. Uh, mm -hmm. function. But we kind of need to kind of speed all of it up, really, I think. Yeah. I definitely agree. I think, yeah, we, we're seeing movement, which is great. But again, it's about thinking more as well. Yeah, the brands definitely need to do something. I think, Dion, your like method of kind of holding them to account, I think that's definitely what we need. But we also need to think from a consumer perspective, you know, how we're approaching 
shopping. And within sustainability, the movement itself, oftentimes it can seem limited to certain people. I know we've spoken about this before, Dion, it can seem maybe restricted to white people of a certain like social class as well. What do you think stops people and people of colour from embedding themselves more in the kind of sustainability movement? Like what barriers are there? Um, I think that we are seeing changes. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people of colour doing fantastic work out there now and mm -hmm. speaking up and kind of um, sharing their stories, sharing their progress along the way. Like there's a person up in Scotland, a stylist, and I just was so pleased looking at her account yesterday. Um, she's a black woman saying that she's trying the kind of like the no buy for a month and she's only on day mm -hmm. two. She's struggling, but she is <laughs> trying. <laughs> and it's just fantastic just watching people pause and mm -hmm. give it at slowing down and recognizing hang on a minute I buy a lot of stuff yeah. um I wonder if perhaps this has been a field that's been more so pushed forward maybe by more middle class people or maybe those um uh and, and less so by kind of like black and brown people maybe mm -hmm. I'm thinking just about availability and when mm -hmm. I'm talking about availability I'm talking about kind of the um kind of like cognitive space that you need mm -hmm. and the availability, the emotional availability that you need to give time and effort and thought to something like this. We do still live in a country with, with a lot of disparity. Um, also, if we look at, you know, where sustainability is also quite big in the United States, there's also a lot of disparity there. Mm -hmm. So if we look at a population of black and brown people in the UK, the majority are still living below the poverty line. So if you are a person living below the poverty line or just scraping by, yeah. you really don't necessarily have the time or the effort or the inclination to be sat there researching about sustainability and think, and blogging about it and writing about it. Mm -hmm. These are actually quite novel or what's the word, um, privileged positions to be in. Mm. That if you have that time, if you've got that headspace, to be able to even give your attention to that. So I think that's what we're seeing, you know, I will put a little post up there every now and again, when I have time, and I am in a, you know, quite comfortable position. But if I was a mother with three children, the last thing I'm thinking about is sustainability, I'm mm -hmm. going to buy clothes that will keep my child warm for as little cost as possible, because electricity bills gas bills are rising nobody's giving me a helping hand so yes i might be aware that this is not the best for the environment the best for my children's future but i'm doing the best i can right now mm -hmm. and even if you are aware you might not want to think about that because you don't need something else to make you feel bad right mm -hmm. now it's true and, and i don't know if there's something oh sorry go ahead joe no no i just i would want to um absolutely second all that i mean there is a kind of class disparity for sure in terms of who can afford to think sustainably i don't shop in fast fashion shops at all really at the moment i can afford to buy a few things and i go to a slightly better shop mm -hmm. uh, i took my kids to hennies because i can't afford to shop all you know we can't all of us go and buy stuff in kind of fairly mid or high end range mm -hmm. brands and they needed mm -hmm. a sweatshirt, they needed a t-shirt. So, you know, we, all of us fall back on fast fashion and, and cost of living will probably mean that that's not going to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And there is that kind of sense of guilt as well, that I think a lot of the time, and it's women as well, so women are doing most of the shopping for their kids, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're a burden of guilt um, mm -hmm. as well. So we are necessarily, we can't completely jettison the fast fashion uh, model, um, but it's definitely kind of there's a class disparity, there's a guilt disparity, um, and you know these things are going to be with us for some time. And it's only when the brands really step up and we've got more options that are more affordable for sustainability that we will see it across the board and from more people able to participate. Yeah, I want to say there's also like a cult, there's more like a cultural element to it as well. I'm just thinking about you know, um, if you are a young person or an adult, even like from the black or brown community, that again, like I said, there's greater disparity in this country. So you may, you're more likely to be first or second generation or third generation and mm -hmm. have come from a background of working class or, um, and that when you do have the money, you're gonna wanna buy new stuff. Yeah. You know, you finally got to the position whereby, you know, you might be doing, I was doing sustainability my whole childhood, not mm -hmm. deliberately, but because you only get hand-me-downs. So yeah. there was circularity right there. <laughs> and, 
and shopping in charity shops, but that's harder now because the quality of clothing going to charity shop is not the same as it was in the 90s or the 80s mm -hmm. because of the rise of fast fashion. So you are getting these kind of um, throwaway polyester garments that they don't last the same way. So it's very hard. So why would a person go to the charity shop and buy a, a polyester dress for four pound where they can go on pretty little thing yeah. and get a brand new one that's just for them for five pounds yeah and then also if you're a young person like i said if you have grown up with not very much and you feel like you finally made it yes of course you want to buy things that are just for you mm -hmm. and if you've done your time you don't want to then be going oh actually i better not buy that because it's bad for the environment it's bad. this is just your first taste of kind of getting into the world as an autonomous adult making those choices and being um, kind of like having that bit of financial freedom. So you want to just have fun with fashion. And I think that the field of uh, sustainability and circularity can be very serious. And I try my best not to be too negative about it. But when mm -hmm. you want to have fun with fashion and you still want to use clothing to make yourself feel good, I think, unfortunately, the last thing you want to do is think about all those clothes going to landfill and all that other stuff. So yeah. it's a tricky position. I think one we have to be quite empathetic to. Yeah, I think it's tricky as well. And I don't know if this is something Jen, you've experienced as well, but I know from like a Caribbean, a kind of West Indian background is the idea of, you know, the way you present yourself and your appearance is very important because you have things like discrimination, you know, things that you need to work to overcome. So looking presentable has always been something that's very front of mind. And then the idea of, you know, shopping secondhand or getting something that's old or, you know, from like, cultural kind of perspectives of oh if someone's um spirit is lingering in that outfit like you don't want that to come on to you like there's all of these kind of cultural connotations that i don't think is really being addressed in the sustainability movement you know every culture has their own specific relationship with appearance and with attire and i think that needs to be more greatly understood to really get people to shift their way of shopping because again they they have all of these things that are front of mind and like you said the environment might not be not not be something that they consider heavily but understanding you know how they can shift their perspective by you know really showing that you understand kind of where they're coming from their specific point of view um and i completely agree with both of you you know if i think as well if you understand more about how your clothes can positively impact you and develop a relationship with your wardrobe, then you'll be less inclined to want to replace it. You know, you'll be more excited about re-wearing the things that you have because you have positive associations with them. They help you navigate different situations. They just make you feel good. Like these earrings, this, this top and wearing, they're really old, they're over 10 years old, but I have that connection with them that makes me, you know, everything in my wardrobe, I haven't worn a new time, it's new to me. I get that rush of novelty and I get that that psychological pull to them as well. And it reminds me of something you know, that you recently article um, it was discussing Bollywood's impact on dress codes and they quoted you and, they, and you said, fashion opens up possibilities for framing the self, however, temporarily. I just thought that was so powerful. And I wanted to know if you kind of expand on that a bit. I think what I'm trying to get at there is that we'll have a lot of options in our wardrobe. We'll have a range of choices and a range of people we like to be when we wear, when we make those choices. Um, I can be a professional academic, and I can also just be a mum on the school run. I can be a Zumba instructor, and I'm going to the gym, my gym gear. So at any moment, if I'm caught in that gear and caught wearing my smart clothes or wearing my sports clothing, I am kind of fixed temporarily. Somebody might read something into the way I'm presenting myself, but it is momentary. It's because there are a whole range of other things in my wardrobe that I could have presented. So at any one moment, we're only ever choosing to show particular, we can only wear a few things at any one moment, and we only ever show some part of ourselves through that out. So we're only, only ever temporarily fixed, and our yeah. identity is always in fluid, and it's always in, in fluid and in conjunction with all the different selves we have to be. We all perform different roles in the social world, mm -hmm. And we have mm -hmm. different clothes that help us perform those roles. So that's, I think, yeah. what I was getting at in that. Yeah. And I love the idea that, yeah, you can use clothes to highlight certain parts and like showcase certain parts of your identity but you could also conceal certain parts of your identity you know you might not always want to be the professional woman you might want to go out and be you know sexy joe you might want to show that part and like conceal the academic side of you and your clothes allow you to kind of step yeah. into yeah 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 and then if i'm out and about and i'm seeing and i'm wearing something that's yeah a bit sexy or a bit more revealing i would never wear into a lecture theater yeah <laughs> 
they might read me, see me in that, have a label, think of me in a certain way, read something from that, and they won't know all the other things, which, yeah, you might be, in that moment, I'm quite happy, because I don't yeah. necessarily, I'm not Joe the academic in that setting, so that's not a problem. So yeah, we're always revealing and uh, by kind of definition and concealing parts mm -hmm. of ourselves whenever we get pressed. That's part of the fun of having a wardrobe that we usually are making those sorts of choices, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I love that, the fun aspect of it. That's something as well, Dion, you talked about, trying to make fashion fun as well. And speaking about fun like and fashion psychology, what what is your favorite concept that you just love to talk about all the time? Goodness me. In the, so the tricky thing, and I'm yeah. going to be pedantic now, I'm so sorry, is that because fashion psychology is such like a woolly area, mm. it's, it's when I, my approach to fashion psychology is I just take core psychology and then I apply it and I look at fashion with a psychological lens. So for me, like any psychological theory, you can apply it to fashion or consider fashion through it somehow. So it's mm -hmm. so like I think people think of the field as being quite limited, like we said about, you know, what's 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 the latest trend what do you think about social media influences and it's like there's so much more than that um yeah. let me think what's one of my favorite concepts psychologically i would say this is not necessarily my favorite but it's one i've been thinking about the most and that is i think i spoke about it before is the arc of determination so mm -hmm. thinking about well-being so when we're thinking about the ways in which people might um, reach kind of peak or good well-being mm -hmm. and there was the theory that said you know what people need in order to reach kind of a good level of well-being is this kind of arc of happiness so you've got the autonomy um, relatedness and connectedness and I really love that thinking and I, mm -hmm. I remember learning it's by Ryan and Desi that theory and I just thought to myself well that applies to fashion yeah. because when I was styling I noticed that people came to you because they lacked that autonomy they didn't know how to dress themselves they didn't know where to start and that by giving them those styling tips people became more autonomous dressers they knew okay I've got that skill now I can go mm. and pick x y and z and put it together and then also that relates to the feelings of competency that you feel like you've got these skills that you understand body shape you understand style you understand tone you understand color what works for you what your style is and then obviously we all know that fashion and clothing is a form of communication and communication allows us to relate to others. And that's where the R comes in, that relatedness. So I love using that kind of model, that kind of arc of happiness to think about and look at fashion through that lens in particular. And I like to look at kind of like which element of that arc of happiness is lacking for a person or is particularly strong for a person or how it's yeah. impacting on them. So I would say I quite like a little bit of yeah Ryan and Desi. I love that. I haven't heard of that that theory really? before. I can't wait to go up and, and read about it. I think okay. that's really powerful. Yeah, understanding like yeah how your wardrobe can help you step into these different like facets mm. using it as a tool. I think that's amazing. Um, and then Joe, maybe speaking more a bit more personally, how have you noticed your relationship with fashion? How do you think it's changed like as you as you've gone older and as you well, experience? Yeah. Indeed. I mean, age is, um, it's interesting being a middle aged woman and having a kind of history with clothes. That means that my body has changed. Mm. Um, I'm considerably heavier than I used to be. Um, so I've actually had to adapt to my clothes to, the, to a changing shape. Um, but it's quite an interesting experience. I mean, on a kind of personal level, I haven't generally been miserable about it. It just meant that I've had to, I've actually had different styles of dress that I've worn at different yeah. ages. Um, so it's been quite interesting. I've probably dressed very differently now to the way I did as a teenager. Um, or even when I started um, my academic career, I think I've, I do dress differently. Um, but then there are sort of slightly negative sides that you have fat, just, you know, fat moves around the body in a different way when you're older. So you do kind of dress in a certain, in a different way. And I'm aware of accentuating areas of my body that I didn't or concealing yeah. areas of my body that I didn't. Um, yeah. So it's a kind of a journey I've quite enjoyed, really. Um, I've also changed my, um, where I shop. So I mm -hmm. did shop in Zara and Henny's 15 years, you know, 10 years ago, maybe even. 
but yeah. I've made a very conscious effort in recent years and obviously because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a professional woman I can afford to buy a little bit more so I buy less and I buy better mm. um, which I think is one of the narratives of, of our age and going back to the sustainability um, points earlier so I noticed I don't shop nearly as much and, and yesterday was my first experience of Henny's in a long long time just because I need some basics for the kids they don't really even shop there very much either but we, we needed to get some bits and pieces so yeah my relationship with my body has changed uh the brands the style of clothes the, the idea of quality and yeah. fit and you reach a point in your life i've reached this point where i can look online at a dress on a website or fabric and i know you know yeah no you know, you know that's, that's something that like, yeah. <laughs> I know that, that that empire line, I can exactly how that's going to feel and fit. And mm -hmm. there's an embodied experience that I've got, I've just gained. And I'm more or less, I'm right. And the occasional time that I take a chance and I just I like something and I buy it and I kind of worry whether it will have that problem that I've had in the past with yeah. that shape or that fabric. And of course it arrives and in, invariably I have that problem. And yeah. it goes mm -hmm. back because you just kind of know. Yeah. Just, know your style and your body and and yeah i can kind of look at something and also know how it's going to feel on my yeah body. i think that's why it's so important i hate when people to just like buy stuff for occasions and they'll buy something very thoughtlessly and very quickly but if you actually take the time to understand what you're buying how certain clothes feel what worked what didn't then you won't have to be making millions of returns every single day and you won't have to you know keep buying I don't any yeah, yeah. I really, I, I, generally don't make that many mistakes I kind of know and know the colors you know you, and they, they, they've changed a bit as well as I've aged mm -hmm. uh, but yeah yeah and I think that's quite a lovely thing about getting older I think I did make loads of mis you know, mistakes I wore things that didn't suit me because they were in fashion going back whereas now I just would never do that I would think what suits me first and yeah. then you know whether it's fashionable or not it really doesn't matter all that much you know it's mm -hmm. about where I feel comfortable and I kind yeah. of know now what makes me feel comfortable yeah, and the yeah, same autonomy. Question. I was gonna say that that's that autonomy and competence coming in there. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Dion, same question to you. How has your relationship with your clothes changed in like recent years? How has my relationship with my clothes changed? Uh, well, that's sounding flippant. I just care a lot less. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just now, I just now, literally, I will put on whatever I feel comfortable in that day. Yeah. And it does really, really vary day to day what I feel like. Sometimes I want to wear bright colours, sometimes I want to wear all black, sometimes I want to wear something very, very loose and oversized, sometimes I want to wear something very fitting. And I think what has changed for me as I've got older is about is my gaze. Before I used to be very outward looking and you always think about well, how other people see me, what will yeah. they think? They think I'm trying too hard, have I not tried enough? Do I look like I'm trying to look good? You know, you don't want to ever, as an English person, look like you've made an effort specifically. <laughs> um, you know, you're continuously thinking and, and dressing for others. And I now dress a whole lot less for others. I very much dress for myself mm -hmm. and I put on what I like to wear. And I think like Joe as well, I shop, I try to shop better and try to shop a lot less. Yeah. And I also, I always ask myself, you know, do I need this or do I want this? Mm -hmm. I'll always try best to find like a pre-loved item first. Like if I need something to look there first, try to rework items in my wardrobe first and mm -hmm. always like those steps before I just jump to buy something brand new. And always like try to wait a little bit, like, you know, see, do I really need this item? Like and wait a few days, see, okay, no, I do need it or I don't. And I think it's just my approach to shopping is a lot slower is yeah. a lot more confident as well as my getting dressed you know if i went to a bar for cocktails and i had on my joggers and a hoodie i wouldn't care now before yeah. i would have been like, oh my gosh i can't go out like this i need to go put on my ankle boots the usual london style and you know dress pro like dress like i'm going out but now mm -hmm. i'm very aware that I am me, I am Dion, regardless of what I wear. And what I'm wearing is what I've chosen to wear that day. And mm -hmm. that's the end of the that's that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. And you know, your friends or your family or the people that know you, they won't see you any differently in terms of your character. Mm -hmm. um, if you're wearing, you know, something that you've been seen in before or something that's a little more casual for the occasion, that is not that big of a deal. So I would mm -hmm. just say like, I care a lot less. I think I've been the same, like my caring is less but 
almost in the opposite way to your saying. Mm. I used to get a lot of, oh, that that is a really bright outfit. Like, where are you going? Like, where are you going here? But I like to wear bright things. I like to dress up. And I used to really bother me people saying, oh, you're doing too much. And now I'm like, I just don't Definitely. care. I'm going to do the most. Yeah. I'm going to put on yeah. a full face to go down the road because that makes me feel good. And you can't do anything to stop me. And I love that. And I do think a lot about understanding more about the sociology and the, the psychology of fashion and understanding how it can be very, very meaningful. And it's a very personal thing to me mm -hmm. that has really made me think more about, yeah, I need to put myself and my feelings first before. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to think about the environment. You have to think about other people. Just we're social creatures, you know, we do have, we're always hitting and fitting norms, but your feelings should take precedent and i think that's that's a lot of what i've learned through my work and through listening to both of you guys as well and this is following your work um and yeah i think this has been a fantastic conversation i really want to thank you both for joining me i feel like it was really illuminating and i hope everyone listening has learned so much about it so thank you thank you both so much um i want everybody to make sure they're following you guys and following along to places where you're posting your research or any work so maybe joe if you want to go first where can people well yes i mean i'm not that visible as i could be uh, I'm, I'm on twitter so you can find me there and i will post um when i'm at events and so on i don't post all the time yeah and i have an instagram account but it's mostly about my kids and my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Twitter handle? <laughs> that people a little outfit thrown in and like, quality snaps. It's, but it's not really my professional place. But Twitter is the place where if I've got anything to say, I'm going to say yeah. it on Twitter. And your Twitter handle is? Uh, Joanne Entwistle, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> um, I use it. Um, but it, yeah, but I'm, I think I would come up. I think it's Joanne Entwistle without the H. Okay. Spell it correctly and it, you should get there. Amazing. And I, I highly recommend the fashion body, the new revised version is out. It's really coming out next year. So I've yeah. just submitted the um what am I talking about? I've submitted the manuscript um and it will be going yeah. for the edits and uh, I think it'll come out in um spring next year. So yeah. yeah, maybe don't buy the second edition. <laughs> I, I bought your book after Jacela um kind of recommended it to me. So yeah. oh, I'm, doing your <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the third, it's got to update that book. So the third edition is hopefully yeah. going to bring it a bit more up to date. It's quite amended compared to the previous two editions. Can I swap? Mm -hmm. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, Diana, what about you? Where can people follow you and hear more about your work? Um, if they want to kind of read academic stuff, then obviously just search my name on Google Scholar to find papers. Oh, um, if you want to just kind of get bite-sized bits of what I'm talking about, then just Instagram is the best, which is at the fashion psychologist underscore. Oh, I'm definitely going to follow you, Dion. I, I am not following you, so I will find you. Go for it. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you everybody for listening and watching. This was the first episode of the Big Just Energy podcast. We made it. And like I mentioned, Big Just Energy, yay, is now available. It's going to be out on the 15th of September. It's out for pre order. Maybe when this is out, it'll probably be out as well um, at all good bookstores. So make sure you grab your copy. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok at Shakayla Elise. And also follow um, Psychology of Fashion um, on... No, sorry. Oh, my God. I'm getting my own hands on wrong. Fashion <laughs> Psychology on Instagram, um, where we post all of our stuff. And follow fashion is psychology.com as well, where we're posting this podcast and just more information about fashion psychology so you can learn more and dress better. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for, thank you. Thank you for having us.